What's up and welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, September 19th. I am Frank Stanfield, joined by Scott White. Today on the show, Mike Clevenger stayed hot with a complete game. Reds pitching prospect Connor Phillips had a great start, the best start of his young career. And we'll take a look at hitters who will be tough to rank heading into 2024. You know the deal. Please help us out by liking this video and subscribing on YouTube if you haven't already. And if you're listening on the audio side, download, follow, and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Let's jump in. You can put it on the board. Yes. Yes. Seeing as how we're uh, both talking about White Sox to start off the show today, Scott, I felt like it was only appropriate to begin with a little Hawk Harrelson. I will take the breadstick. And we'll start things off with Mike Clevenger turned in the second complete game of his career and the first since April 21st of 2018. He allowed six hits here against the Nationals. One run allowed, seven strikeouts to zero walks, had 13 swinging strikes on 109 pitches. And trying to dive in a little bit more and see what's different for Clevenger this year. How has he turned things around? You know, the past couple of years have been pretty rough from him know that he's dealt with a lot of injuries. The velocity is up a little bit this year. Fastball is averaging 94.3 miles per hour. Last year was 93.6. He's throwing less sinkers. Changed the pitch mix a little bit. Uh, You know, more forcing fastballs and more sliders for Mike Clevenger this year. But outside of that, it doesn't look too great. You know, under the hood, it's he's got a 5.07 xFIP. So I don't know. Things aren't don't look too great for Mike Clevenger when you dive in a little bit more. But look, if you've been kind of starting him here, you got all these great uh, outings from him. He's 71% rostered. He's locked into your lineups in two in a two-start week. He's at the Red Sox this weekend, and he's got the Padres in the final week. What are your thoughts, Scott, on Mike Clevenger? And I don't know, is there anything sustainable here to get excited about for next year? Well, as you just pointed out, that's, this was his last good matchup of the year against the Nationals. And I did have him as a, as a sleeper pitcher. Actually, he was the, the cover photo of the sleeper pitchers article this week. So you feel extra good when the guy, every, the guy whose face is shown before people even click on it when he has a good game. Um, but, you know, if, if you're talking a daily lineup league, do you start him for his second start this week at Boston? I would have thought I'd say no. But this was such a good start, complete game effort. And now four of his last five starts have been amazing. So you were kind of giving the rundown of what's changed for Mike Clevenger this year compared to last year. So you're doing like season long. Because I'm interested in figuring out what's changed for him just in his last five starts. Because in four of his last five starts, you know, you got a seven inning, one hit, 10 strikeout effort, a seven inning, three hit, no run effort, six innings, two runs, seven strikeouts, and and then this complete game effort at Washington today. Between those four starts, a 16% swinging strike rate. So it's not just like he's, you know, gotten good defense behind him or, um, you know, you can't just reduce it to luck. He's, He's legitimately missing bats. I gave the numbers only for the four good starts in the five start stretch because within that five start stretch, there was also an eight run 12 hit disaster against the Tigers. So we can't, you know, we obviously can't just dismiss that completely. But the four good starts are, were so good for Clevenger that I feel like there has to be something to it. It doesn't mean whatever is behind it is sustainable and that he's going to be back to being a high-end fantasy option moving forward. But at least for now, he's figured out some measure of success uh, at Boston later this week. You know, if it's, if it's, if it's a daily lineup league points scoring. Okay. I think you obviously start Clevenger. If that's the case, if it's category scoring depends what you're looking to make up ground in ERA and whip, maybe play it safe and sit him. Wins and strikeouts, if that's what you need more, then you probably do start him at Boston. Yeah, I think for people who play in daily lineup leagues, they'll already know on Sunday what they need in order in order to either win or sustain a win. Or if they're trailing, you know, like you mentioned, chasing wins and strikeouts, you get Clevenger in there. Uh, Looking at it now, too, he, he also is not giving up as much hard contact as he has in years past, not giving up as many home runs either. So 
obviously those things have helped uh, for a guy who throws, gets a lot of fly balls at this point in his career. I uh, will point out the matchups recently have been awesome, Scott. I mean, a lot of these great starts, the Nationals he just faced today, the Royals before that, Tigers, Tigers, and Oakland A's. So a very favorable schedule here for uh, Mike Clevenger, but an awesome start for him on Monday. And with that, I'll throw it over to you, your player of the night. Okay, so you took the the Olive Garden breadstick there in Clevenger, and there are a bunch of other noteworthy performances that I could highlight, but I kind of want to go off the map a little bit and and talk about Tim Anderson, who we haven't talked about much this year because he's been horrendous. One home run all year. And among qualifying batters, he actually has enough at-bats to qualify. Only one home run in all those at-bats, but uh, third lowest OPS among qualifiers for Tim Anderson, actually below 600 is his OPS. So it's it's been it's been terrible, no doubt. But he did get four hits here on Monday. All four of those hits were hit more than 111 miles per hour, and three of them were hit more than... Oh, wait, do I get those numbers right? I I'm sorry, I gave him too much credit. That seemed too high. All right, all four of the hits were over 101 miles per hour, and three of them were over 103 miles per hour. Uh, so, you know, four very hard hit balls for Tim Anderson. And, and you look at the StatCast page for him, hitting the ball hard hasn't really been his problem. His max exit velocity, his average exit velocity, his hard hit rate, pretty much in line with career norms. I mean, higher than some of his great years. Uh, his strikeout rate isn't outlandish either. You know, it's not the very best strikeout rate he's ever had, but it's not the worst strikeout rate he's had either. Um, it, and then you look at the, you look at, at, at more of the under the under the surface plate discipline numbers like zone contact rate and and chase rate and all of that. They don't look so bad either. So it, it's it's kind of a head scratcher why he's been bad his launch angles down okay that that's adjustable obviously it was higher than it is this year earlier in his career so it's something he could get back to i i wonder how much the knee injury that he suffered way back in april how much of an impact this, that's had on the rest of his season because he's not that old he's 30 and because the decline that we're seeing in this, the actual on the surface statistics aren't reflected in sort of those those skill indicators that that um, we're always emphasizing on Statcast and elsewhere. I, I wonder if I wonder if he's poised to have a big bounce back season next year. Now I wouldn't stake a lot on it in next year's draft. I imagine as bad as this year has been for Tim Anderson, he's going to go undrafted in the majority of leagues and should, but you know, some of those deeper Roto leagues, like a middle infield option in a 15 team league. I, I think, I think there's a lot of reason to uh, approach Tim Anderson optimistically as late as he's going to be going. And you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You didn't invest that much in it, but I, I don't know that any, I don't know how much has actually changed for him. And it, it just seems like it, I get the impression it may just be a lost year because he was playing at less than 100% most of the time. Yes, a confounding season here for Tim Anderson. One home run, as you mentioned. He has a club option this offseason for $14 million. I don't know what team he's going to play for next year. Yeah, that, that's just... a good point, too. I mean, he actually has a negative war this year. Um, $14 million doesn't seem like, a big ask to bring him back and give him a chance to prove it by the White Sox. Uh, but they could just be free of him for a million dollars and then he, he'd sign wherever. And it, there's a chance if, if they let him walk, he's not even going to be a starter for wherever he signs. That, that's a possibility, in which case I'll have to rethink everything I just said because I don't want Tim Anderson if he's a backup somewhere. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting decision for the White Sox and you know, it got me thinking the knee injury because for however long he was healthy, it was what two weeks basically. He hit 298 with seven with a 731 OPS for those two weeks before he suffered the knee injury. We had no reason to believe anything was wrong with him. He stole five bases during that two week span to Tim Anderson. He was off to a great start. Um didn't hit a home run, but 
Yeah, I don't know. It, it got me thinking because Manny Machado, there was a report today about Manny Machado is going to be limited to DH for the Padres for the rest of this season and may decide to shut it down early so that he can have surgery on his elbow. He's going to need surgery on his elbow. I was like, what? What's going on with his elbow? I didn't even, I, I don't know. It may have. I may have seen that he was missing a game here, there with an elbow injury, but I didn't know there was something major going on that required surgery. Turns out it was way back in May. He, uh, he came down with tennis elbow and he's been playing through it ever since. So I, Manny Machado season has been a little confounding, not to the extreme that Tim Anderson's has, but I don't see a lot in the underlying indicators to, to make me think, okay, well maybe Manny Machado is just, not going to be good anymore. Um, and so, you know, it seems like he's been playing at less than a hundred percent for most of this season too. And that, that might explain why it's been a disappointment again, not to the extent Tim Anderson has been, but to a certain extent. Yeah. I noticed the same thing. I saw this report about, you know, surgery for Manny Machado that apparently is going to take six to seven months to recover from this tennis elbow injury that he's dealing with. And it seemingly Came out of nowhere. Um, so you said he was dealing with an elbow injury in late May. I saw that that was last year. So he might have been playing through this for the past two years, Scott. Well, you know what? I, I may have I may have just looked at the month and the day and not even bothered to look at the year when I saw the update on it. So, okay, maybe let me see what I found again to confirm what you're saying. Not that I doubt what you're saying. Because I was Sorry. reading an article on, I think it was MLB Trade Rumors, and they mentioned that he's kind of been playing through this for, for two years now. So uh, I think it might have been yeah. May of last year, too. So Yeah, it was it was May of last year. You're right. So, th yeah, this could have been... And he had a great year. Machado had a great season last year, right? So he could have been playing through this for some time. I, you know, he had... Uh, he had that fracture in his... I think it was hand or wrist, right? Earlier this season as well, so... Machado's been playing through a bunch of stuff and he's typically someone that just kind of plays through injury and he just kind of goes about his business. And, uh, but man, um, yeah, he's an interesting one for the off season too. Let's see what happens there. Uh, he, he they could shut it down at some point already this season so that he gets right. kind of an early start, have that surgery and hopefully ready to go for opening day next year. So that was some of the news I wanted to hit up front here as well. Some, uh, I guess bad news for Manny Machado, which seemingly came out of nowhere. I uh, wanted to give a shout out to uh, Adam Wainwright, who threw seven shutout innings for his 200th career win. Obviously, it's a pretty awesome milestone for him. The, the fifth active pitcher to reach 200 wins. Uh, the third Cardinals pitcher joining Bob Gibson and Jesse Haynes. So I know Wainwright was, he was stuck on 198 for a while. And then it took me, he finally got 199 recently. Uh, and then there you go, 200 wins for Adam Wainwright. Uh, I think in his age 42 season. So shout out to him. Awesome stuff there. And shout out to Kyle Schwarber, who hit a 483 foot home run here on Monday. Uh, the Phillies kind of giving the Braves a taste of their own medicine, huh, Scotty? Five home runs hit by the Phillies on Monday night. Kyle Schwarber hit his 45th. Nick Castellanos hit his 25th. It's been a, I think, quietly solid bounce back season for Nick Castellanos. JT Real Muto hit his 19th. Bryce Harper hit his 18th. And Johan Rojas hit the second career uh, home run for him. The good news, we mentioned some of the bad news with Manny Machado. Ronald Acuna was back in the lineup Monday uh, after missing two games with right calf tightness. So hopefully anyone who had him on their team, you saw that update, you keep him in your lineup here. Let's uh, talk about some of these waiver wire pitchers, Scott. Obviously, there's not much going on. We've got maybe just one matchup less. I think most people... If they play in weekly lineup leagues, they're already locked in for this week. So we could just talk about, I don't know, matchups for the final week of the season. But three names up top who I knew you liked all three. Brian Wu had a solid start at the Oakland A's. Five shutout innings with six strikeouts in that one. Continues to lean mostly on his four-seam fastball and his sinker. And he is at Texas this weekend. And then home against Texas in the final week of the season. Edward Cabrera. Uh, good on you. I know that you were adamant about using him, and he pitched very well. Five and a third, one run allowed, four strikeouts against the Mets. And uh, look, the key for him is always control. He only walked one in this game, and he had a great start. So he either walks one or six. Yeah, three or games, two, or three, five. 
Three games since returning for Edward Cabrera, 193 ERA, a 107 whip, 17 strikeouts to nine walks over 14 innings. He is home against the Brewers this weekend and at the Pirates in the final week. And we mentioned with Clevenger, he's at the Red Sox this weekend and home against the uh, Padres. Anything you'd like to add on, I guess, Brian Wu and Edward Cabrera's starts here? So no good matchups for Wu left. It's worth pointing out. You probably had him active for the two-start week, mainly because of Oakland, but then his next start is at the Rangers. Uh, it's really interesting how he's been successful. You, you, you mentioned it already, but I just want to stress it, underscore it. He basically just throws fastballs. It's weird. It's it's mostly different variations of fastball, but pretty much just fastballs. There's the four seamer, which gets a lot of whiffs. There's the sinker. He threw them a combined eighty percent of the time in this one at Oakland. He also throws a cutter, not nearly as much as those other two, but again another variation of fastball basically, and somehow that works for him. And you know that's it. It seems like that's kind of the Mariners whole philosophy, right? Even when they brought in Luis Castillo, they, um, they had him, uh, I forget which one he was throwing with Cincinnati. If it was primarily the two seamer or the four seamer, but they had him basically ramp up the usage of the other and not throw secondaries as much. And I mean, he's taken a step forward. I feel like since coming over from the reds and I don't know, it's, it's, it seems to be working for him. They obviously have a good pitching staff. But Wu is taking it, I think, to another extreme. Not even really showing a traditional breaking ball or off-speed pitch. I mean, he's technically thrown a few, but not not a significant percentage of them. Yeah, you know, I made the Brandon Woodruff comp with him last week. And while you were talking about all the different variations of fastball, I think a better comp for Brian Wu is actually Lance Lynn. Yep. Right? That's what I was going to say. Yep. Yeah. The way Lance Lynn has kind of gone about his career, the four seam, the two seam, the cutter, you know, just kind of dotting these fastballs all around the zone. I don't know. That might be a better comp here for uh, Brian Wu. It's interesting, uh, but you're right. A lot of the Mariners pitchers have done this. George Kirby relies heavily on fastballs. We know Bryce Miller, the same thing, that kind of riding four seam fastball. Um, but it's an organizational philosophy. And for now, it seems like it's working for, for most of those guys. Uh, let's move on to this next group of uh, waiver wire pitchers. John Means, he actually had a solid start here at the Houston Astros. Five innings, one run allowed, three walks to one strikeout. Obviously, you don't love that, but look, mm-hmm. to go into Houston against a lineup that crushes lefties and have a successful start. I thought that was uh, good to see from John Means. He's at Cleveland this weekend. His final start is against the Red Sox. Cutter Crawford turned in a quality start at the Rangers. Six innings, two runs, seven strikeouts to zero walks there. Uh, his first quality start since August 19th, and he faces the White Sox this weekend and then at the Orioles in the final week. And Cal Quantrill turned in another solid start. He was at the Royals, five and two-thirds innings, two runs, three strikeouts. Completely changed his pitch mix in the start. 49% splitters. That was 7% entering the start. So, like, a pitch he barely would use was his most used pitch in this one for Cal Quantrill. He also threw his curveball 26% of the time. Thought it was kind of interesting. He faces the Orioles this weekend and then at the Tigers the final week. So that's a good matchup there. Scott, anything you want to add on uh, Cal Quantrill, Cutter Crawford, uh, John Means? Well, I wish I could share your optimism for Means because I've, I've very much liked, expressed my interest in Means over the years. One strikeout in five innings. That's been the case in each of his two starts since returning, and I don't think that's a formula for success. One strikeout in five innings. Now he does get a great matchup next time out at Cleveland, but I I still think he's in the prove it stage versus me being willing to use him in fantasy. So if 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 it is a daily lineup streaming situation, I'm I'm still uneasy about using John Means. Uh, I'd like to see him have at least a decent strikeout outing before the season's over so I can go in with some reassurance next year. Not that I think it's a lost cause if he doesn't. Obviously, coming back from Tommy John surgery is 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 not something that normally happens at the snap of a finger. You're back to being who you were. But um, need to see more strikeouts for means is the bottom line. Cutter Crawford remains pretty interesting. 
he has starts like this semi regularly. Um, it's just his bad starts are uh, intolerable. That that's really Cutter Crawford's problem. But for the year, twelve point three swinging strike rate, twelve point three percent swinging strike rate. That's pretty good. Three point six two expected ERA, better than his actual ERA. Uh, he's he remains kind of interesting. Not enough that I think you're going to get much use out of him this year anymore. But I I wonder if he'll be in the Red Sox rotation plans for next year. All right, let's uh, move on to these final two pitchers I wrote down. Connor Phillips, the Reds pitching prospect. He had a great start. Picked up the first win of his career, first quality start of his career as well. Seven innings, two runs, seven strikeouts to one walk. He had 11 swinging strikes on 93 pitches. And maybe it was misclassified on StatCast, but apparently he threw a slider 20% of the time in this start. And he didn't throw an actual slider in his first two starts. It was classified as a sweeper. So I don't know if it was actually a different pitch or not, but... Yeah, I don't know either. Maybe tomorrow they'll kind of change it back to sweeper, whatever it was. The point is, he looked pretty damn good here, Scott. And the guy, he's, he's kind of got some moxie. He's got some swag to him. He's like yelling at people and he's pitching and he's walking off the mound all this kind of i don't know pretty hyped up guy it was it was fun to watch he shaved his goatee too so shout out to connor phillips uh jose buto who pitches for the mets he now has three strong starts in a row he was at the marlins six innings one run six strikeouts to one walk there and uh in 32 innings pitched this year a 309 era a 134 whip i actually picked him up and started him in south War scott which was very risky but worked it's, worked, it's worked so far. We'll see. I don't yeah. know. At the Phillies this weekend and then home against the Phillies in the final week. It's pretty scary stuff. Um, anything on uh, Jose Buto and Connor Phillips? I, I Connor Phillips, I, it's pretty clear he has talent. I'm not ready to trust in him after this start. I mean, he had one swinging strike in his previous start at Detroit. So he's still feeling his way through uh, you know, feeling his way into the majors, I guess feeling it out. I don't know. I'm trying to make that work now that I committed to the word feeling and it's not getting any better, no matter how many ways I say it, but he also has control issues does Connor Phillips. And I just think, uh, I, I don't think he's going to have a chance to really gain our confidence before the season's over. Pirates, Buto, Pirates this weekend for Phillips. Yeah, I don't, I'm not. no, it's not me. It's not me. I mean, it's it's working for you in that Tower Wars League, but I don't know. I kind of have a problem with the league that's set up that you could just throw any pitcher in there and it's going to work out for you in the long run. I mean, um, I've, I've thrown pitchers in there where it works out very poorly, Scott, so it's... Apparently not, because you're going for your third straight championship. Yeah. If you're consistently doing it, it seems to benefit you in the long run. Quantity over quality. Uh, basically. <laughs> Jose Buto. I, I mean, it, it, it is kind of it's it is worth stating in this podcast league. Um you get to change your lineup midweek, right? In uh in Tout Wars. <laughs> yeah, sorry, in Tout Wars. In this Tout Wars yeah. league is what I meant to say. You get to so it's yeah. it's CBS because you're the champion. You get to you get to choose what head to head scoring format you use. You choose CBS's standard point scoring, um, but unlike CBS, you get to change your lineup midweek. You change your lineup on Mondays and Fridays, and it is deeper rosters than just the normal CBS scoring. It's uh, roto style lineups. You have seven starting pitchers and two relief pitchers. Uh, yeah, you can still use Sparps too. So there are kind of ways to. I don't want to say. I mean, I guess the word is manipulate, right? I don't, I'm not cheating. It's within the rules, but right. you can, I, I just load up on a bunch of pitchers on my bench and try and get as many starts as I possibly can on my Mondays and Fridays. So. My point being the way you like spam starters in that league, there's less opportunity cost than the, the opportunity cost isn't as great as in a standard CBS points league where. Uh, you don't get the opportunity to change your light at midweek. You have to commit to the five starters and only five starters for the entire week. And you have just a five man bench to work with. So there, there are some differences there. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, back to Jose Buto. I just, I don't see it. I don't see it. And it's 
we've had a few of these pitchers in the second half who arrive without much pop prospect pedigree and you look at their minor league numbers and it's nothing special there either. I mean, Jose Buto in the minors this year had a 593 ERA, 163 whip and less than a strikeout per inning. And he comes up here and he's looking like sunny gray. And I just, okay. I, I could find reasons to see why Christopher Sanchez was making it work. I could find reasons why Javier Assad to a lesser degree than Sanchez, but I could I could see some reason why he was able to have a run of success there. I don't really see it for Buto. And so uh, with two matchups remaining against the Phillies, uh, I think unless you're in a league like Frank's Tout Wars League, <laughs> probably stay away. Uh, to be t- totally honest, I- I'm pretty scared of these starts against the Phillies. So I'm already locked in. Uh, actually, I guess technically I could get him out this weekend. Bench him on Friday. I might do it. <laughs> I don't know. At the Phillies, it's pretty scary there. Uh, their lineup has really come around. Let's take our final, not final, first break of this. And we'll, when we return, we'll talk waiver wire hitters and uh, some other hitters, guys that might be tough to rank in 2024. We'll do that right after this. Freddy, surprise, Dad. What's going on with your son? I wish I knew. Got a girlfriend I've never even heard of. When I told him I wanted to spend more time with him, he said no. This is not a good time. Have you considered that he hates you? <laughs> Don't sit there! Those are Christian Lacroix pillows. So we can't sit on the couch? Not in jeans. <laughs> Welcome back in. Let's uh, run through some waiver wire hitters here again. You know, not much left on the schedule, but Ronnie Mauricio continues to run with the Mets. One for four with his sixth stolen base. Uh, He's already got a home run as well. He's hitting the ball hard. Lots of ground balls, so you don't love that. He is 45% rostered. Does that number sound right, Scott? You think that should be higher for Mauricio? Final week of the season or so? I mean, I I don't think so. I've had trouble getting him active in any of the leagues where I have him. Uh, and even though, if, you know, it seems like he's done well, I've looked at his weekly point breakdown. I understand points leagues are probably the format you'll least likely use him. Uh, let's see. He had 18 last week, which isn't bad, but six the previous week, 10 the week before that. I don't know. It hasn't translated to great fantasy production, even though he's hit for a good average and stolen some bases. All right, next up, we've got Alex Kirloff, who went one for four with his ninth home run in 10 games since returning. He's batting 276. He's got that one homer that uh, also has one steal, and uh, he's 28% rostered. I looked at the Twins matchups for the final week. They've got three games against Oakland, three games in Coors Field, so you must be thinking, this is amazing. They also have three lefties on the schedule yep. as of now. So, yeah, uh, what I've been saying all along with Edward Julian, like you'd right. like to take advantage of the matchups, but uh, same thing with Alex Kirilov. By the way, I just thought this was an interesting note on Kirilov. So it wasn't the home run, but he had a ground out in this game that he hit. I'm always looking for silver linings with Alex Kirilov. He had a ground out that he hit. 108.7 miles per hour was his hardest hit ball of the year. Find someone who loves you the way Scott loves himself. Some Alex Kirilov. Uh, two names in deeper leagues. Ryan O'Hearn went five for five with a double and two RBI. Quietly had a really good year for Baltimore. The stack has numbers look pretty good for him as well. He's 17% rostered. Nelson Velasquez went one for three with his 14th home run. 31 games now with the Royals. He's betting 235 with 11 homers. So that batting average has come down recently, but still hitting for a good amount of power. Uh, anything there, Scott? Final week, deeper leagues, Ryan O'Hearn, Nelson Velasquez. And the strikeout rate hasn't been terrible for Velasquez either. 28% with the Royals. It's high. It's high, but it, we've seen it higher from him before. I don't think it's, I don't think it's prohibitively high, I guess is the better way to put it. Uh, last week of the season, let's see, they're facing the Tigers and the Yankees, so those are pretty good matchups. I don't know exactly what pitchers line up when. Maybe it won't end up being such good matchups, but in theory, it could be good matchups for Velasquez. 
uh, I don't know. If you're, if you're looking to make up ground in home runs in a five outfielder league, I think he's in the discussion at least because I do think the power is legit. O'Hearn has a left-hander problem as well. He doesn't play against them. I think what we've seen, because we weren't sure how they were going to divvy up the playing time with Heston Kerstad getting called up and Ryan Mountcastle not playing with a shoulder injury. Well, it does seem like O'Hearn has been in the lineup more regularly than Kierstad has. Let's see, Baltimore next week. If these matchups hold, it looks like just one left-hander. Um, and the matchups are not bad. I don't know. Somebody to consider in deeper leagues, I guess. Yep. Though, though, it is worth mentioning, uh, it was reported today Ryan Mountcastle is not going on the I.L., with his shoulder injury. So he may come back before this week is done and shake things up a bit. Two names in two catcher leagues, Bo Naylor. I've been really impressed with Bo Naylor recently. One for three with a walk and his fifth stolen base, his last 21 games with the guardians betting 333 with four homers, four steals, 14% walk rate, 17% strikeout rate. So great plate discipline during this time, power, speed, just not a skill set we see often from a catcher. Uh, he's 24% rostered. Looks like the Guardians only have five games next week. I don't know how much he matters for this year, but a, a name to know for sure as a sleeper catcher, I think, heading into next year is Bo Naylor. And I think the same thing could be said for Luis Campusano. I mentioned him on yesterday's podcast. The guy, he hits well when he gets an opportunity. He went three for five here on Monday with his seventh home run, three RBI. He's batting 307 on the year, 831 OPS. He's 14% rostered. Uh, I think both of these guys are only two catcher league plays for now, Scott, but any thoughts on Bo Naylor and Campusano? No, I think they could be breakouts next year too at that position. More talent coming in at catcher, which is welcome because we are losing Dalton Varsho and MJ Melendez, and they may not be the only ones that we're losing from the position next year. Oh, Henry Davis. We're going to lose him as a catcher next year. Uh, so we, we could use another little bit of infusion, a little infusion of talent here. I've always liked Campusano. He got to the upper minors at like as a 20, 21 year old and continued to produce there. Uh, he had, he at one point in time was using a 40 ounce bat in the minors, which gives you an idea of his strength. I mean, most players use like a 32 ounce bat. 40 ounces is insane. Wow. I doubt he uses it anymore, but that was some of the talk coming out of the minors at the time. And he was producing, he was making lots of contact with it. Um, so he's still young enough that he could live up to his potential. And, you know, since they're more or less out of it at this point, um, maybe, Maybe they're willing to tolerate his defensive shortcomings in a way they wouldn't normally. So maybe the plan isn't for him to just retain the job heading into next next season. I don't know. We'll have to we'll find that out in the offseason, obviously. But if Campusano is the plan behind the plate for the Padres moving forward, then I'm excited about the upside. Yeah, for sure. Let's hit the rest of the news and notes. Mike Trout will join the Angels for their six-game road trip this week and will start swinging a bat soon. There's still a chance he can return before the end of the season. Max Freed will not make his next turn in the rotation after developing a hot spot on one of his fingers. The Braves aren't uh, overly concerned, and they think Freed might even be able to make a start this weekend. Sandy Alcantara for three. 20-pitch bullpen session on Monday, his second since resuming this throwing program last week, uh, and he remains hopeful to return before the end of the regular season as well. Obviously, the Marlins have hopes of making the playoffs too, and um, you know, it would help having someone like Sandy Alcantara. Of course, the good Sandy Alcantara, not the one we saw earlier this season. So, who knows? Josh Young and Adolis Garcia were both activated from the IL on Monday. Uh, you know, big additions there for the Rangers who are trying to make the playoffs as well here. Matt McClain could return as soon as next Tuesday. He took batting practice on Monday and will look to ramp up baseball activities throughout the week. He's been out since August 28th with a right oblique strain. Tanner Bobby was placed in the IL with right hip inflammation and will miss the rest of the season. It's been a phenomenal. I don't know. Maybe I'm overrating it, Scott, but is phenomenal the right word? I think it's a really, really great rookie season for Tanner Bobby that we saw this year. 
did a, another rookie have a better season? I guess Kodai Senga, who yeah. is kind of a rookie with an asterisk. I, a, I think Bybee had the best rookie season for a pitcher other than that, right? On a per inning basis, maybe you can go with Yuri Perez, but I don't know. Bybee Yuri did it for Perez's longer. Last few starts haven't been that great. Uh, yeah, I guess he has a lower whip and a better strikeout rate, though it's close with the whip. Uh, uh, Bybee hasn't beat slightly in ERA, and I, I just think his starts were more usable by and large than than uh, Yuri Perez's has been. But yeah, I mean they they they've both been good. All right, Salvador Perez was placed on the seven day concussion IL. He took a foul tip off the catcher's mask on Saturday and then was out of the lineup on Sunday. Shane Bieber pitched well in his second rehab start, striking out seven over three and two-thirds scoreless innings at AAA. He averaged 91 miles per hour on his fastball, which is down a little bit from where he was at earlier this season. Uh, Bieber could take Bybee's spot in the rotation later this week. The Brewers will likely have to make a decision on Tuesday whether to place Christian Yelich on the IL or not. He took part in baseball activities Monday but was not ready to return to the lineup. Hassan Kim has missed two straight with abdominal discomfort. The team is still trying to identify exactly what's wrong with uh, Hassan Kim. Tristan Casas is unlikely to play again this season. He's still undergoing tests on his right shoulder, which landed him on the IL last Friday. The Mets announced on Monday that Edwin Diaz will not pitch the season. A return for the final week might have been in play if the Mets were in playoff contain contention, but obviously they're not. And instead, Edwin Diaz will focus on 2024. Orioles manager Brandon Hyde said that Ryan Mountcastle is not a candidate to be placed in the IL. He's missed five straight with shoulder soreness. Carlos Correa was removed after re-aggravating the plantar fasciitis in his left foot. Starling Marte will accompany the Mets on their road trip in Miami this week. The 34-year-old has been out since early August due to a groin strain, which could be related to that core muscle surgery that he had last offseason. Brian De La Cruz has missed three straight with a sore right ankle. Hunter Renfro was designated for assignment by the Reds. Harrison Bader was placed in the IL with a right groin strain. Brett Beatty has missed five straight with a left groin strain. And Joe Adele was reinstated from the 60-day IL and will be available Tuesday against the Rays. A few prospect updates here, Scott. Uh, the Brewers. Top prospect, Jackson Churio, was promoted to AAA. I think they have maybe a week left in their season. But he is 19 years old. He hit 280 with 22 home runs, 43 steals at AA this year. And I don't know. I, I guess we'll see how this final week or so goes in AAA. But I think he's going to be in play for an opening day spot with the Brewers next season. Yeah, I would agree. I, I thought he had a chance of coming up late this year. I I suppose that's still possible. Bo Naylor was called up, I think, for the final weekend of last season. So it's it's never too late. Uh and the Brewers you know, if 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 they think he can uh, I don't know. Would he be eligible for the postseason? I don't know the rules on that. Because I don't think he's on the 40 man roster. Um I actually don't know. Yeah, I don't if he know. Would be or not. But uh, you know that it, it it would if they thought he could help for that it it, it that might factor in the decision making. Look, it's it's not the most likely scenario. The most likely scenario is they're calling up to AAA and they're going to be satisfied with him ending the year there. Uh, but I agree that he'll the progress he's made this year, particularly with regard to the the strikeout rate. Uh, I think Jackson Chorio is very much in play for next spring. And again, if he hits well in this whatever final week of the season at triple a, whatever it might be, you know, Jordan Lawler got called up to the D backs after playing only 16 games at triple a Jason Dominguez got called up after only nine games at triple a. So yep. It's not crazy. Yeah. I, I think there's a chance we might see Jackson Churio in the final week of the season and, and then maybe potentially helping the, the brewers in the playoffs as well, because, you know, I think they could use a little bit more thump in that lineup. Uh, if they do have faith in uh, the 19 year old helping them out. The Rangers are promoting their first-round pick from this year's draft, Wyatt Langford, to AAA on Tuesday. And the 21-year-old has hit 359 with 10 homers, 9 steals, 
and an 1168 OPS in 41 games across three different levels. And he's looked amazing, Scott. I mean, this is, you know, one of those prized assets. Why you want a top two or three pick in your first year player draft. We've talked about him a lot recently, but yep. the numbers are awesome. And he's already getting pushed up to triple A. So Wyatt Langford, not to be confused with Wyatt Langmore, <laughs> is a, uh, I mean, you kind of, you didn't even mention the best part between, Rookie ball high A double A, 30 walks to 28 strikeouts. He's reached it at a 471 clip. Oof. Power, speed, average. You know, I think the consensus was that Dylan Cruz, the White Sox first round pick from this past year, he was drafted second overall while Wyatt Langford was drafted fourth. Nationals. What did I say? White Sox. <laughs> yeah, Nationals. I'm in Nationals. Um, I think the consensus was that Dylan Cruz was the better of the two, but it was close enough that I do wonder if, if Wyatt Langford is going to creep ahead of him in the prospect rankings for next year. And then of course, Paul Skeen's the first overall pick for the pirates is, is the third of the three that I think, I think they're all going to be top 10 basically on, on uh, national prospect rank lists. Um, so yeah, I was thrilled to secure the third overall pick in our first year player draft Scott White Dynasty League next year because I'll get one of the three of them. I've kind of been assuming all this time it would be White Langford, but now I don't know. I hope it is. Yeah, I don't know. We uh, shall find out. The Rangers also plan to promote Jack Leiter to AAA, and it's been another rough year for their former uh, first-round pick as well. He but he's been better recently. I was His yes. last four starts have been pretty good there. They put him on something called the development list, which allows them to, I don't know, put him, <laughs> plug him into a computer or something and fix him. I, I don't know. He seems to have come back fixed because problem, Jack Leiter's problem ever since being drafted. Of course, he was the second overall pick a couple years ago and looked like a can't miss pitching prospect, son of former major leaguer Al Leiter. Um, but his walk rate was just terrible. It's been terrible ever since he was drafted unexpectedly. In four starts since returning from this development list, he's walked just four in those four starts, 25 strikeouts to four walks. And so that's encouraging because the stuff was never in question for Jack Leiter. And I think he's back to being a dynasty asset. There you go. The development list is uh, the same as the Matrix, basically. That's <laughs> what it sounds like. I'd never heard of the development list until this year, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it seemed to do, it seemed to do Jack Leiter a world of good. All right. Let's take our final break. When we return, we'll run through some hitters that could be tough to rank in 2024. We'll take a look right after this. Wake up to football highlights and news from around the world with the one and only Morning Footy Team. Rise and shine, football fans. Welcome to Morning Footy. Start your all-day football craze with Morning Footy, part of the all-new Galazzo Network. Welcome back in. Scott has an article that is coming out on the site, cbssports.com slash fantasy slash baseball. Tough players to rank for 2024. And Today we'll do hitter Scott. Later on in the week, we could talk about some of the pitchers that you have on that list as well. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because we have all off season to talk about these guys. So you know, you thirty. Know, you know, you're kind of. You know, I haven't even written. I haven't even finished writing the article yet. This is a spoiler alert here. Yeah. I don't know that there's that much crossover between the the podcast audience and the readership, but yeah, that's fine. Let's continue. Oh uh, yeah, you know, I didn't even mention to you. Well, we're doing this on the podcast today, Scott. Um, I guess I should tell you right now. Is okay, right? thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's uh, let's run through some of these names here. We'll do like a minute or less on each of them. At catcher, you have Mitch Garver, who we've talked a lot a lot about this year. He's great when he plays. 267 batting average, 17 homers, and 883 OPS. He's done that over 77 games this season. Mm -hmm. um, that's the most games he's played since 2019. So I assume that's why you have him at the catcher position. Oh, there's a lot of reasons why he's going to be difficult to rank next year. Not only like you pointed out, he's good when he plays. There may not be anybody better at catcher than Mitch Garver. When he plays, we've seen this various times at various points throughout his career, including now. Um, but 
Uh, yeah, he has he has to stay healthy. He has to get consistent at bats. Is is fixing him to the DH role like the Rangers have done recently the solution to that? Maybe. But you know what? He's a free agent in the offseason. So we don't even know we don't even know if his next team is going to follow the Rangers formula. 33 years old. There's just a lot of question marks for Mitch Garver and we've we've been reminded of the upside like I I just dropped JT Real Muto for him in a league where you know it's just me and one other person competing still but that's that's how much I value Mitch Garver's bat right now um but there are a lot of question marks so I don't know how high you can actually rank him for as good as he's been and has always been a lot of question marks for the Blue Jays as well Scott at first base you have Vlad Jr on this list at shortstop, you have Bo Bichette. Uh, for Vlad, we know it's been a disappointing year. 267, 24 homers, a 788 OPS. The ground ball rate is actually down, and that's usually what we want from uh, Vlad Jr. He's still hitting the ball hard, but they have these new dimensions in Rogers Center, and he is not hitting well at home this season. And, uh, you know, really he had that monster 2021 where the Blue Jays played in, you know, two other minor league ballparks that were extremely hitter friendly. So we're still left here just trying to figure out like who is the real Vlad jr. At this point, I, I have no idea where to rank him or where he's going to go in drafts, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Cause we gave him a pass this year for the disappointing 2022 and all these, the numbers have only gotten worse after we gave him the pass. And meanwhile, he's, he's gotten, He's he's been surpassed by some newcomers to the first base position, specifically Cody Bellinger, Bryce Harper. I mean, Christian Walker's been a lot better than him this year. I don't think I'm going to rank Christian Walker ahead of him next year. But that's that's the thing is it's hard to know exactly how high to rank Vladimir Guerrero because you still have to account for the upside. He was the top player in fantasy in 2021. Still only 24. Still a stat cast page lit up in red. Tremendous expected stats. Like if, if you're if you're picking one player today to lead first base the most years moving forward, it would still be Vladimir Guerrero. But how high do you rank him for next year specifically? It feels like just a guessing game. Is is he gonna bounce back or not? Yeah, at second base you have Luisa Rise, who we know that had that amazing first half, batted over 380, still had a solid second half here. He's overall, it's a 354 batting average, 10 homers in 865 OPS. I was going to say a better player in points leagues, but at least according to CBS's algorithm, he ranks 57th overall in Roto this season as well, but he just doesn't really do it with power and speed. It's, it's a very wow. unique profile. It is. There's, there's only one Luis arise and he is the Number one batting average guy in baseball. Nobody does that better than him. But he's a detriment in home runs, stolen bases, and RBI in three categories. So whether or not, how how valuable he is to you really depends on the build of your team. And given that second base is kind of overflowing with upside at this point, there's tons of upside to be found at that position. It almost feels like a resignation to take that um, that single category standout in Luis Arise. And then you also have to guard against the fact, you know, what if he doesn't hit 350 next year, but 315, which was kind of the norm for him prior to this year. So like just because he hit 350 this year doesn't mean he's a lock for that every year. He'll he'll definitely be a help in batting average, but to what extent? And um yeah, that's even even in points leagues that makes him hard to rank. Spencer Steer, we know, also had a great first half of the season. He really just had an awful July. If you look at his monthly production, he hit 233 with a 614 OPS in July. He bounced back in August. He's having a big September here so far as well. Overall, 22 homers, 14 steals, batting 269 at 815 OPS. Uh, I don't know, Scott. Why do, you, why do you have Spencer Steer on this list at third base? Well, None of his skills stand out. He's managed to be productive in spite of them. That was also true for Jonathan India, his rookie season, and has been kind of lackluster since then. Uh, they don't really have a position for Spencer Steer. He's kind of been bouncing around. So um, as, as players with louder skills are introduced to the Reds lineup, of course, Ellie De La Cruz, uh, Noel V. Marte, I think is in that discussion as well. Even Christian Encarnacion Strand. Like, how much of a step back can Spencer Steer take with those very middling skills? How much can he 
take a step back in terms of productivity and remain an everyday player in a crowded lineup like that. I don't know. That's why he's hard to rank. Fair enough. Uh, on Spencer Sear, 25 years old. He was a pretty productive player in the minors as well and obviously has a great home ballpark, but I don't know. I think I kind of like Spencer Sear. I don't, yeah, I don't, I guess he is kind of hard to rank. I just, I don't even know where he's going to go in drafts next year. He's right. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I'm not, I'm not saying I don't like these guys. I'm just saying right. there are reasons to like them. There are reasons not to like them. They're just, there are questions about playing time or upside or just a, a lot of confusing factors that um, make it no, make it hard to know exactly where they fit. All right, Bo Bichette, I mentioned the name earlier this season, 303 batting average, 18 home runs, three steals, a, uh, over 123 games. We know that he went on the IL twice this year, once with patellar tendonitis and then a strained right quad. He's been terrible since coming back from the IL. So part of this is just, you know, how much have the injuries kind of affected Bo Bichette this season? But also, I don't know, his skill set, he doesn't really run anymore. He only has three steals this year. I agree with you. I, I I think he's a pretty confusing player at this point. So I think, yeah, the, the steals are a big question mark. Are they coming back or not? His sprint speed has continued to decline. It, it was in the lower half of the league this year, Bo Bichette, and he just basically stopped running. That doesn't mean he'll always stop running. I've, I've been saying for years that that is, uh, a decision-based stat. It's largely a matter of intent, how many bases you steal. And for whatever reason, Bichette hasn't had the intent this year, but it could come back. It could come back, and that could obviously change things. But right now, I think we have to presume he's not much of a help in stolen bases. And so it's a question of how much power he's pr going to provide. And this year, it was awfully disappointing. Um, does the Blue Jays home park have something to do with it? Because I know... I noticed he was going the opposite way more this year, Bo Bichette. And it seems like right field is, is where it's the hardest to hit it out there. Uh, even split home and away with the home runs nine in each fin in, in each, you know, both home and away better batting average on the road for Bo Bichette. But you know, if he's just a 20 Homer guy who hits for a good average and doesn't provide much in stolen bases, you know, I noticed the run and RBI production was down quite a bit this year too. He's he's a second tier shortstop and certainly not the first slash second rounder we've we've come to know him as. Um, but how much do you see him bouncing back this next year? That's that's the biggest question for Bichette because he's still only 25 years old, not far removed from that kind of production. Sort of the same case with Vladimir Guerrero. But I would say I am Like I, I, I don't, I, I think Vladimir Guerrero can approach his peak again. I, I, I'm pretty confident at some point in his career, Vladimir Guerrero will approach his peak. I don't know if it'll be exactly as good as that 2021 season, but it'll be nearly as good. I'm not as confident Bo Bichette is going to approach his peak again. And I think the upside with Bichette and Vlad, I think they're kind of correlated, right? Because I think for this lineup, for those guys to kind of reach their ultimate upside, they need both of those two to be playing at the highest level possible, right? And that's what we saw back in 2021, right? When they had crazy run and RBI outputs and big power and, and Bo Bichette was running that year. So I think their their upside is kind of correlated, I think, if, if they're both going to kind of max out here ever again. If they do, they probably will. They're young enough to do it, but we'll see. Uh, four more names here. Well, just a quick thought on each of these three outfielders. And someone you have in the utility spot, Cody Bellinger, Cedric Mullins, Lane Thomas, and Marcel Ozuna. Uh, Bellinger, we know he's had a an amazing bounce back season, but the previous three years combined, he hit 203 with a 648 OPS. So uh, maybe we're just past that, but it was a it was a good amount of time, right? Uh, Cedric Mullins, kind of a down year here. He's been sitting against lefties recently. He's been on the IL twice with a groin injury. So I kind of how much is that? injury kind of played into it. Lane Thomas has come back, back down to earth in the second half of the season. And Marcelo Zuna, he has 35 home runs. He has an 869 OPS. But if you look at his year-over-year -year production, wildly inconsistent. So, <laughs> yeah. Like, what are we going to get? I have no idea. I, I don't, that's the thing. I, I don't know what we're going to get from any of these players next year. Cody Bellinger, MVP caliber this year. 
18th percentile average exit velocity. And, and he's a free agent too, so we don't even know where he's playing. Right. Uh, how much the environment's going to impact that. Like they they all deserve to be drafted within the first five rounds next year based on their production. I don't I, I think Bellinger will. I'm not sure any of the others will, but like you could certainly make the case for it based on how they perform this year. It's just, you know, Mullins, is he gonna get, get back to being a 30 steel guy? How valuable is that in the base the stolen base environment we're in now if he's not going to be the 30 homer guy he was in 2021? Uh Lane Thomas you know, was thought to be a fourth outfielder type, got on a rebuilding team that had a need in the outfield and ended up producing a lot more than that. But it kind of it kind of reminds me of like Nate McClouth, who had a season or two like that for the Pirates and then just cratered after that, was never really a factor in fantasy again. I don't know if you remember him, Frank. Nate McClouth. Um, the Braves originally traded Charlie Morton to get Nate McLeod from the Pirates. It didn't go so well. I was going to say he played for the Braves, right? Or... Yeah. Um, and then Marcelo Zuna, he was the top outfielder in fantasy in the shortened 2020 season. And we all bought him pretty hard the following year. I think he was like a third round pick on average, third, fourth round. And obviously two dead seasons after that, before he bounces back with another huge season. And, you know, historically good lineup. You definitely like to have as many shares of that Braves lineup as you can, but it does feel like if you if you value him next year based on his 2023 production, it's it's um you know, it does kind of feel like you're you're being led into a trap if you do that based on how things have played out for Ozuna previously. But then where how late is too late? to take him. I, I don't know the answer to that either. It's going to be, I, I think Ozuna is the single most difficult player to figure out his draft value for next year, because it just, the range of outcomes seems so wide and, um, and, and yeah, obviously he's, he's, he's burnt us really more than once in the past. Uh, the 2020 to 2021 is the biggest example, but it, it happened earlier in his career too, where we thought he was a stud. And then the following couple years, he turned out not to be so great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some tough players to rank for next season for various reasons. You can read more about it on the site, cbssports.com slash fantasy slash baseball. Some quick leftovers here. We'll start off with the pitching leftovers. First up, the good. Zach Wheeler had a bounce back start at the Braves. Six innings, one run, five strikeouts with 16 swinging strikes in that one. Freddie Peralta continues his great run. He was at the Cardinals. Six innings, one run. Six strikeouts to zero walks. His last 10 starts, Peralta has a 196 ERA and a .74 whip. Jordan Montgomery also had a great start against the Red Sox. Seven innings, one run, eight strikeouts to zero walks. 21 swinging strikes on 95 pitches. Anything to add on Monty, Peralta, and Zach Wheeler? Um, not really. Not really. I mean, Montgomery, he threw his curveball a ton, which may have contributed to him getting so many swinging strikes, 21 of them. But and unless it becomes a pattern, I don't know that there's much to take away from that. Okay. Uh, one okay pitching leftover. Justin Verlander turned in a barely quality start against the Orioles. Six innings, three runs allowed, five strikeouts, had 13 swinging strikes on 89 pitches. Over his last four starts, he's a 5.19 ERA. Tons of hard contact allowed during that time. Anything on Justin Verlander? He's going to be a really difficult player to rank for next year, too. Because it certainly looks like he's declining, unsurprisingly, at age 40. And, um, you know, but he's been a useful pitcher overall. It's a really difficult environment for pitching. And so he's still going to have value, but exactly how how high should you value him? It's 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 going to be tough to figure out. Now, the bad pitching leftovers. Joe Ryan has gone just five innings or less in four of five starts since returning from the IL. He was at the Reds. He allowed four runs over five innings pitched. He walked three. Um, and I, I don't think he gave up any home runs in this start, but obviously home runs have been a problem for Joe Ryan overall. And uh, five starts since returning. A 365 ERA, a 122 whip, so... Overall, he's been pretty good, but uh, this one was not very good for Joe Ryan. Kyle Wright, another rough outing up against the Phillies. 
four runs allowed over four innings. He also walked four. He gave up three homers in that start. So the combination of bad control, giving up home runs right now. I, I don't know. Do we just give Kyle Wright a pass, Scott? I was I was thinking about you know how to value him. It's like last year was such an outlier for his career, but then this year, obviously, he's just like pitched through a bunch of injuries and the shoulder hasn't been right. So I don't know that we really put anything into this year, but like last year was also an outlier. So I, I think Kyle Wright is probably a tough pitcher to rank moving forward too. Well, I don't, I don't think it's going to be that tough unless he has a good start at some point and, and maybe it'll happen. You know, hopefully certainly seems like the Braves will be a team that go deep into the playoffs and, um, if he's a part of that rotation, then we'll get more chances to see how he performs. Uh, in addition to the shoulder issue, he's kind of been changing his delivery this year. So there, there are a lot of uh, variables that work here for Kyle Wright. In addition to, you know, you know, one of them just being how he performed prior to last year, last year being an outlier. So a lot of question marks. If, if you, if you are looking for a silver lining here in this start against the Phillies, he did have six whiffs on his curveball. It was the pitch he threw the most six whiffs on it, a 43% whiff rate on that one pitch. And I know, um, there was some optimism on the Braves broadcast. And I, I saw Kyle Wright talking to the media afterward that they, they feel like, they feel they felt better about the start than the stat line showed was the general consensus, partially because some of those swinging swing and miss numbers for Kyle Wright. So um, not all hope is lost here. Obviously, you're not using him in fantasy, but I think it's going to be very important the way his last couple regular turn season, uh, his couple regular season turns go and then whatever playoff chances he gets. I think that's going to say a lot about how we approach Kyle Wright in 2024. Because if there's nothing good to take away from it, he's probably just going to be an afterthought. Yeah. All right, let's talk about a few hitting leftovers. Royce Lewis went one for four with his 15th home run. He has homered in four of his last eight games. Luis Robert went one for five with his 36th home run. He added three RBI in that game. CJ Abrams went two for four with his 42nd stolen base. Still providing very good power and speed, but I noticed... The batting average has taken a step back since the start of August, 42 games for Abrams. He is batting just 217 over that stretch, uh, 44% fly ball rate and a 14% infield fly ball rate. So kind of feels like Abrams is uh, maybe just off getting underneath the ball a little bit. And, and as a result, some, some easy outs there for CJ Abrams. Wilson Contreras continues his strong second half. He went one for three with his 20th home run. And in the second half, he's batting 313 with 10 homers and a 969 OPS. JD Martinez, three for four with a double dong, five RBI. And now on the year, he's batting 266. He's got 28 home runs, 90 RBI, and 870 OPS in just 101 games. I was blown away, Scott, when I realized this guy has 28 homers in 101 games. I felt like JD Martinez missed so much more time than that. But it's been a great year. 290 ISO. That's his highest since 2018. He's hitting the ball extremely hard this year. Also a free agent. And I know he's older, but like the dude still seems like he has a lot left in the tank, at least based on this season. Well, he did miss. I mean, he has missed what about a third of the season. So to get to 28 home runs and, and 90 RBI is yeah, saying a lot. It's a near 45 home run pace over 150 games. Yeah, there you go. And and the RBI, you know, when you got Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman just a little ahead of you in the lineup, that's that's bound to happen too. Um, yeah, no, he's been great. He's been great. And, um, you know, the Dodgers kind of went with the – they kind of went with the youth movement this year. And uh, J.D. Martinez was one of the players brought in to alleviate that. Jason Hayward also. Hey, Jason Hayward has the best slugging percentage in OPS of his career. So they they kind of picked up both those guys off the scrap heap, and it's gone very well for them. Mm -hmm. Man, J.D. Martinez on a one-year deal. He's 36 years old. I, I, I really hope that the, the Dodgers bring him back for at least one more year because, man, what an awesome year it's been. Speaking of the Dodgers, Freddie Freeman picked up his 20th steal. That's right. Yes. A 2020. 2020. 
Freddie Freeman. Let's go. Kind of, uh, Ryan Klesko had a couple of 2020 seasons back to back for the Padres, kind of mid, mid midway through his career when he was already into his 30s. Never had a 10 steal season otherwise, but back to back 20 steal seasons to go along with 20 plus homers. Um, so this Freddie Freeman, really this year and last year for Freddie Freeman, didn't quite get to 20 last year, but just a spike in steals out of nowhere. Kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's been an awesome year for him. Some some power and speed. Obviously, a great batting average to boot. And uh, lastly, Nolan Jones. Hopefully, you listen to Scott. He's been talking about this guy for, I don't know, a month now. He's up to 80% rostered. He went 3 for 5 with his 17th home run of the year on Monday. A few bullpen updates for the Royals. A gentleman named James MacArthur struck out one for his first, sa uh, first save of the year. And Taylor Clark picked up saves on both Friday and Saturday for the Royals. My guess is he was likely unavailable here on Monday. For the Marlins, Tanner Scott got the ninth inning with the game tied. He gave up a run on two hits. He took his fifth loss. Course, on the other I've side, talking him up. Uh, yeah. Ah, I mean, he is Tanner Scott, right? I guess this was bound. Oh, his numbers are awesome. He has the fourth most strikeouts among relievers this year, and he entered this game with like a two fourteen ERA, two twelve ERA, something like that. For the Mets on the other side, Adam Adovino struck out two for his 11th save. For the Cardinals, Ryan Helsley recorded the final four outs, uh, two strikeouts for his 12th save. And I think he now has the last five saves for the Cardinals. So he's been very reliable recently. For the Red Sox, Kenley Jansen is on the COVID IL. So Chris Martin picked up his second save. For the Astros, Ryan Presley entered the ninth with a two-run lead. Gave up a three-run homer to Cedric Mullins. Took the loss in that one. For the Orioles, Sionel Perez got the uh, bottom of the ninth inning with a one-run lead. He got the first two outs, and then Yanir Cano got the final out for his seventh save. And then for the Padres, Josh Hader picked up his 30th save of the year. To stream or not to stream, we will start with Tuesday, where we have uh, Logan Allen at the Royals. We have Javier Assad against the Pirates. We have Paul Blackburn against the Mariners. Kenta Maeda at the Reds, maybe. Christopher, to, Christopher Sanchez at the Braves. I'm trying to remember what I said yesterday. I think I said... A, no, I said Logan Allen at the Royals, Javier Assad against the Pirates, Paul Blackburn against the Mariners. Those were my top three. Okay. So no love for uh, Kenta Maeda. Still don't try. I know he had a bounce back outing last time out, but he was so bad before then. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not ready to trust him. All right. On Wednesday, we have Michael King against the Blue Jays. We have Josiah Gray against the White Sox. Bailey Ober at the Reds. Reese Olsen at the Dodgers? Question mark. So I'm very curious to see how this Josiah Gray outing goes. Because remember last time out against the Pirates, he had... Um, I think he had 10 strikeouts, right? And much better control, a different delivery, different pitch selection. If he can follow that up against the White Sox, I'm going to be very encouraged for Josiah Gray, but I don't think I actually want to use him. Uh, who do I want to use here? Uh, nobody. I, I'd be most likely to use Michael King against the Blue Jays, I think, just because I he hasn't really had a bad start yet, but he hasn't been going deep into those starts either. So I don't know. Bailey over at Cincinnati could go okay, but he's he's a fly ball pitcher in a small ballpark. So yeah. that seems boom or bust. Yeah, that is pretty risky. I I think those are my top two as well. Ugh, if you're really desperate, I guess Josiah Gray, but yeah, I agree. I don't I don't think I want to risk it there with Josiah Gray. We're gonna wrap there for Scott. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to fantasy baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify, and we will be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.